So hi, my name is Dominic, and today I want to show you how Cockpit works with, uh, as a modular system. Right? Fedora is trying to modularize, and um, that means different things, obviously. But I'm going to show you how, how Cockpit works with, uh, with dealing uh, with a bunch of different technologies and, and, and techs and APIs, and how we survive as a project, even though we're relatively small. So, our protagonist is Cockpit. I'm, I'm, I work on the Cockpit team uh, for Red Hat. And um, I'm going to using it as a case study to show you how we think a project like that can work. Uh, mostly because I'm familiar with it, obviously. Um, but it's always good to have a solid application when discussing abstract concepts. So instead of just talking about how it should be in general, I want to show you how we, how we do it. And then we can get into a dialogue of how that can apply to other things. So as an intermission, um, I'm just going to start with a little demo right away. I think that makes, makes sense. Um, what we have, this is what you see when you log into a system. Right? You connect, connect your system with a web browser. You can just type in the username. And this is the username from the system. You might have seen the login face already. And as you can see, you can log in. Um, so what our goal is, is to make Linux and, and RHEL discoverable to a broader admin audience. Um, it should make tasks in Linux more discoverable. And we can't look at all the features today, obviously, but we can, we can see what the, what, the, what the system can do. We can join the main. We have system time, power options. You can look at services that are running. You can look at Docker containers. Start Docker, so that started. Um, system logs, you can do storage, set up raids, logical volumes, networking, just a bunch of things. And all these little pieces, or most of them that you see, are actually modules inside Cockpit. So we have a shell, Cockpit itself, and there are modules that perform a specific task. And each of those modules interface with different parts of the system. So we have modules working with modules, basically. Um, so that's why I think it's, it's good to take, a, take away a few lessons from this. So back to the presentation. Um, we can say Cockpit is a remote interface, a remote interactive admin interface. So what that means is it runs in a browser. You can connect to your system from anywhere. Um, it's zero footprint, and you use it to configure a system. You don't configure Cockpit. Right? So if you log into your system via Cockpit, then that's the system you see. Cockpit doesn't have its own configuration. It doesn't have an extra state. That's just the system. You have to use a system user. And if you set up your system and remove Cockpit, it will work the same way it did before, although you can't log into the, the cockpit anymore. But it doesn't, I mean, it, some of you may know previous attempts to, to configure everything, control the whole stack. That's not what, what, what cockpit does. There are really great tools out there that, that configure a system. Some are, some are usable via the CLI, some have a DBus interface or REST APIs. And what cockpit does is bring those things together. So what we do is we call system APIs directly, and that from your browser. And I'm stating this again just to drive the point home. We see ourselves clearly in the presentation tier. So you have the really the the, the lower level, the kernel. You have the LVM C groups. That so you can say where the rubber meets the road, right? That's the data layer. That's the lowest level. Then you have the logic stuff that decide what's going to happen. You have the system be network manager, Kubernetes, all those useful tools. And then you have the presentation tier, cockpit, CLI, and other, other presentations you have. And those should, should work with each other and augment each other. And no, if, if possible, no logic should be inside cockpit. Because then it's not accessible with other, by other means. And that means you're limited in how you work. And when you work, you want to achieve a specific goal. You don't want to work for a tool, but just use it to achieve something else. And to explain this maybe a bit, a bit further, a little bit more technical, um, we have 
the web interface on the client side. So that's a browser running somewhere on, on the operating system of your choice. We have the Kotlin web service, that's Kotlin WS, that's network stuff, that interfaces with a browser, and that communicates with the Kotlin bridge on the system. And that bridge runs as the user that you log in as. So there's no, no daemon that runs in the background, no other service. When you log in, that bridge spawns, it communicates, translates all the stuff, and when you log out, that, you, that goes away again. Um, the web service can run in a container, and it doesn't even have to run all the systems. You can use one system as a gateway and, con and connect to other machines, but that's, uh, yeah, that's a, that's more detail. And then the bridge forwards all the, the communication to the system APIs. And the, the bridge doesn't have to be aware of all those APIs, so that, that logic is actually in the, it's on the client side. And the main means of communication, obviously, is, is SSH. Um, we can't use SSH from the browser. That would be nice, but it, has, it would have bring its own problems. So what we have is a WebSocket. That's what we use. Um, our supporting cast, stuff we work with. This is, the, this is by no means a complete list. And I will spare you reading all of that. Um, it's just, for example, Docker, Atomic, LVM, CLI tools like, like sudo, we use all kinds of things that we interface with to make, make, the, make the, the, the web interface or the, actually usable for the user and bring the this, this stuff together. Um, yeah. um, some of the stuff we've contributed to to, make, to, to make, bring them together. Um, some of the other teams have helped shape their APIs so we can consume them. But the important thing is that we don't try to take their logic, and we, we trust the other tools to do their job and bring them together to do what's necessary. So it's just a crazy amount of APIs to keep track of, right? So that's, that's one of the big points here. And if, if we would map this out, this is, just like, this is just a family tree, so you don't have to read the text. If we would map out the, the dependencies, it would probably look something like this. Um, we've, never, we've never tried mapping it out, because that would just be insane. So now I want to show an example, a specific example of how we interface via Dbus. For example, Dbus is very important for us, it's asynchronous, and you can actually open the Dbus session in the browser. This is a short video, for example, we have the host name here, and if we open the debug session in the browser, we can actually connect, we can use JavaScript to connect to Dbus. So that object will have completion. For example, you can see, okay, I want to see the kernel release, kernel version. You can use this to debug, actually. It's, it's very nice. It makes, makes debug accessible. Then we can say, okay, let's see, set, set host name. We do that. And that, set, that interfaces with the debug process on the server. And you see right away, it changed. So, and if, if we go to a, to a terminal, at this, uh, do it, uh, change it in a different way, you can see it, it took effect. If we use a CLI to change the host name again, then the browser will receive the notification via Dbus and it will change right away. So it's really interchangeable because in, in the end, when you want to do something on a system, you don't really want to care about how it's done as long as it's done properly. And what you, what you really don't want is a second state that you have to keep synchronized. So the system is the state. And also, from personal experience, I can say that debugging or developing with, with Dbus is a lot more comfortable in this setting than trying it out on the, on the CLI. So to, to give you a better picture of what happened in the background there is we have the, the, the web interface with the JavaScript where we instantiated our little helper library that's part of the, the, the cockpit API that interface with the, the WebSocket, the web service. And that sent those commands to call a Dbus API with certain parameters and received an answer. You can do that with a ping, for example. You can receive text back. You can say you set the host name. And those are translated from the bridge as, as the user you're logged in as to the system APIs. And this, this API 
uh, of Kafka that is stable. So it just spawn processes, interface with dbus, open files. It explicitly does not contain anything that's API specific. So it's it's a very uh, very generic and lightweight API. So what drives Cockpit, right? We have, it's obviously based on the, on the open source principles, on the agile principles. And what that means, I'll go into uh, a bit further later. Um, we, don't, we don't pull things in, we don't, we don't own the other things. We, we use them as, as they fit. Um, we try to keep our work distributed, try to keep our work open, and um, deliver early, deliver often. And, um, the most important thing is, with all the things that you saw, the APIs, we have to test a lot, right? So we can have lots of ideas and lots of good ideas, but if it doesn't work, then it's not really much use to us. So we have to test to make sure that everything works. So let's bring it all together. We have all the APIs, we have Docker API, we have different system APIs, user account management, disk management, raids, um, network interfaces. And luckily for us, upstream APIs never change. They always stay stable. Um, they all, they're always thoroughly tested to catch every single bug, so we never have to worry about that. Um, all the distributions are the same, so we can just implement it once and we're happy, right? So what could possibly go wrong? Well, I'm trying that with cars blow up in our faces. Um, since we have a combinatorial explosion, if we say we have all these system APIs <coughs> running on different operating systems, maybe even different versions, then you can't you can't test it manually. It's just it's just way too much. So it's safe to say that the project lives and dies by its testing. Um, testing is not always as fun as creating a new feature, <laughs> but um, going back and keep having to fix features all the time isn't fun either, so testing is actually preferable. Um, so due to the way it's set up, that we consume so many APIs, we, the, the testing is very vital to us as a project. Um, and rather than, than paying the price of having this, <coughs> this huge abstraction layer and trying to encompass, encompass everything, we think of every possible uh, expansion in the future, what we do is we do a lot of testing just to, to stay on top of things. And so right now we have about 10,000 testing instances a day. That means actual virtual machines with Fedora 24, 23, 22, Fedora testing being spun up, running on new pull requests and being spun down again. And you can see the results on GitHub. Um, so each, each pull request we have upstream Gets 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 really run hundreds or thousands of times before it, before it's actually merged. But the key is that it is tested before it's merged because you couldn't you couldn't do it manually. So it's very important that this is done upstream. Obviously, we need robots for that because it's just way too much to do manually. So continuous integration is the key word here. Um, if we want to release early and release often, then we have to make sure that the quality matches that. Um, open source has typically and historically taken the hit exactly there. Say you, you have a certain cut for, for, for features and then you start testing, right? Um, and then it turns out you actually find bugs and to fix them, then it's not, it takes longer to fix them, then you push back release dates. So these cycles keep getting longer and longer. So in order, to, in order to, to make this work, you have to test before merging. You have to test continuously. So this, is what, this is what the tests look like typically on, on a pull request on GitHub for us. Um, we test on real operating systems. We have Fedora, 24, Atomic. We have um, different browser tests with Chrome and Firefox. We have CentOS 7, RHEL 7, we have RHEL Atomic. And this is, this is not just no, this is not just unit testing. Uh, unit tests are masqueraded as the Travis tests there. There are a couple of thousand unit tests that run also. But the integration tests are really what the, the thing that catch the most, the most issues that users will have, because it opens an actual browser and 
inter interacts with cockpit. So here, usually, a, a pull request will only get merged if all the tests pass. So if a test fails, either the test is broken, which does happen, um, especially race conditions are our favorite, or the code broke something that wasn't supposed to break. Um, and with, with all these operating systems, it's really hard, difficult to keep track of all the side effects of coding, right? So, um, um, for example, our master branch, we also test against Fedora testing, so we can see stuff that comes, see, see errors coming before, before they actually hit us in, in production. And from, from the infrastructure point of view, our virtual machines, um, they use libvirt. You can run our test infrastructure from, from your developer machine. You can run it from a Docker container that you can deploy in some machine that we have. Or you can run it via Jenkins. It, it doesn't really matter. And this is reflected in our testing architecture. So we have, we have GitHub, which we use as the, we call the single point of failure, which does fail occasionally. Because um, that's where our that's where our source code lives, right, upstream. So that's where we have the, the status and the pull requests. We have FedoraPeople.org, where we store images, our virtual machines. Not every developer should should have to create their own testing images of, of Fedora 23, and we have to make sure that we use the same testing images. Well, we store logs for all our tests um, on the servers, and then. If, you have, if you're a developer of them, see on the left side here, you have your Git checkout. You can, you can run a test on your machine. You can run all the tests. You can run a single test. It's your choice. Then we have Verify machines that are publicly visible. They have, they check GitHub. They see if there's no pull request. They test those. Then they can run multiple tests at the same time. Maybe they can scale. They can do that. And we maybe we have a fire, uh, testing machines behind a firewall. It doesn't matter. As long as they push the, the results, into the visible space, it doesn't matter where the tests are run. So this is a big important aspect. Um, it doesn't matter to us where the tests are run as long as everyone can see the results. If you can't see test results, it didn't happen. So what we have there is we have, we look at testing tasks that have to be run, like um, create a new testing image, for example. Um, we try to create a new image every week for Fedora, for example, to get new packages and see if the API has changed. Um, we see the, the testing status on GitHub. We can pull images, push images. And we have, sadly, known issues, like tests that, that we know that fail currently because of um, issues upstream from us. But um, yeah, we keep track of those as well. So I want to show you a quick demo of how that testing works in practice. Um, it wouldn't be a productive day if I didn't open a pull request. Holding a talk is no, no excuse. Yes? Yeah, uh, uh, we will, uh, will we uh, see some of the testing scripts like, to get an idea of which testing framework Okay, yeah, I can, I can get... Uh, uh, it's not necessary right now, but um, the, the idea is that for us, it's, we don't use a testing framework, right? So um, we have, I'll get more to that later, but as like, a slight, slight peek ahead, um, we have tests that use Avocado, we have tests that use Selenium, we have tests that use um, PhantomJS and Python, we have tests that compile binaries, it doesn't really matter. We have different, the tests are really modular. So whatever you want to run as a test, our framework, all our framework does is build cockpit for a target system, say Debian, Fedora, whatever you want, start up a VM, install those packages, and run your test. So I can, I can go into, we, we can go into more detail on a specific test that you think might be, are useful, but in general, um, it shouldn't matter which language or which framework the tests are in. So, wow, this is huge. <laughs> yeah, so I looked at the, the README for testing and noticed that 
there's some parts in there that aren't really necessary anymore. And maybe we should maximize this. So we can commit my changes. We don't have a certain script anymore. Committed this to my to my fork. Then I'll go to cockpit project. I'll open a pull request. It's really big. <laughs> and you should see our test for us start to pick this up. Travis picked this up right away. And the other test runners, they periodically scan GitHub, and they should pick this up. So I can also do this locally, because, like I said, it doesn't matter where tests run, right? Um, or GitHub scan. The D is just for dry run, so it doesn't change anything. And that should scan GitHub for new tasks. And that's exactly what the, what the, um, the test runners, we call them, actually do. Um, there's no, no separate, there are no separate scripts or infrastructure. So what you do as a developer is also what the test machines do. And this shows, I'm going to make this a bit smaller. Yeah, so you can see that different, wait, where did this go? Yeah, the different pull requests, this should be mine, I think. Should be tested for different different operating systems and specific image versions. And also in a couple of days, the images will be refreshed. For example, we have, we'll have a new Fedora testing image in 2.5 days. That's like a seven day task. But this is not picking up for some reason. But, uh, our, our lab with the test runners is moving today, so most of them are down. But in the end, once, once that is updated, it should look like the other pull requests, like this one. And you'll see a list of operating systems, the tests that passed, tests that failed. And you can look at the results. For example, you have um, this container is actually a container test. It creates a new Docker container. You can see the Fedora test failed. We can look at the details if it opens. And the important part is that the test results are publicly visible, right? So you, you can work with those. It doesn't matter where they were run as long as you can see the results. And yeah, the connection is not really running, but I have, luckily I have one open. This is an example of, of a test where the where a rebase failed. And the test runner says something is something. I, I couldn't automatically rebase your pull request onto the master branch, so please fix this. We can't merge it as it is. And in other cases, you'll see a list of tests and the ones that failed and the ones that succeeded. But apparently not right now. So I'll just go back to the presentation. So as a quick review, we have the diff different parts of the testing system. We have GitHub that we use. We have our, our test runners that um, choose what, what, what to run, and they're very distributed. We have the test artifacts. Um, we have the testing images. We have the containers. We have packages. We have a log sync. Um, so places where you push logs, it's just, just a Python script, you drop in there and connect the SSH. And we have the, the different test suites, those should actually be plural, plural different, different set of tests. And you can also run single tests or individual tests. So 
so like I said, distribute is really the key here. Um, you don't want to bind yourself to single testing framework, right? Because um, frameworks come and go, I mean, especially in the, in the JavaScript world, things change uh, at a very rapid pace, other languages. And sometimes you have different parts of a software that, that require different types of tests. So, or maybe even have existing tests. So there's, there shouldn't be a reason to convert working tests into a different framework just to have a different framework. Right? That's usually, usually wasted time. And by making the results public, you make them accessible, and you really reduce the, the infrastructure load. Distribute also scales a lot better because if you have a bunch of test runners running somewhere, obviously, then you don't have to run all the tests on your own machine, which would take a really long time. So if you need more test runners, just scale them up via Jenkins, provision them via Ansible. It doesn't really matter, um, and just just use them when you need to. So one could argue that one of the reasons that open source is successful is that it's distributed. Right, so that's, that's what, what makes it work. We have a lot of people collaborating to produce something greater than what they could do on their own. And tests are part of the, tests are part of the software. So we can't, we can't hoard our integration testing. Right? It's, it's not an advantage you have. It, it's, it's something you need to share. If, if you hoard it, you, you lose part of the advantage you have with it. Um, it's, it's the same mindset as you shouldn't hoard source code because it, it just doesn't benefit you in the long run. Um, so in order to benefit from the tests, um, it needs to be op they need to be upstream and open source. So one could say, to sum it up, the framework is not king. You shouldn't, you shouldn't write tests to, to fit to a certain framework. That shouldn't be the, the goal. Um, pro pro one project isn't better than another just because it uses a different framework. Um, they are tested better if they have better tests, if the coverage is better. The framework should be, should be secondary. Instead, we can say that the feedback loop is king. This, this kind of is based on, on the Agile principle. Well, you, you'll find that in there. Um, so we have feedback from, from, from the tests, from users. That's, that's the whole reason why we want to release early and often, is to get that feedback. If we have long cycles then it becomes more difficult as a developer to, to react to changes, to react to, to, to wishes, to, to change your mission, to change the vision. So what you want is to really reduce those feedback loops down to a minimum. As an example of that, so if we work for Red Hat, um, we had the Red Hat QE testing. Some of you might be familiar with that. So the, what you do is you develop your software, and then it goes into testing. And they get back a bunch of bugs and say, they say, please fix these. But that's, and maybe upstream, you've, you've already gone three, four versions past that. So you have to go back, you have to rebase, you have to do a lot of work. So what we did is we moved all those tests upstream. So for each, each pull request that we have, those tests are actually run. That's a lot easier for QE and a lot easier for us. Um, the same with packaging. If, if you're going to package things differently than, than what you test on, something will break. Right? Everything you don't test is going to break eventually. So what, what you do is we actually package, in our tests, we have the test VM. We package our software, we install them as those packages, and test them as they would be if we had released that software. It also makes automating releases easier if you test it all the time. And of course, QE still runs tests and they, they have some very specific ones they also run, but the, 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 core of the, the core of the tests are run all the time upstream. So one could argue that tests are like microservices. Um, we, um, we have different tests for different software. Okay? Um, when you're testing, you always test something that you change, you get something that didn't change, and when you have a test, you want to reuse that test. For example, um, Cockpit tests could be used to test um, a, a new version of Cockpit against a known version of Fedora. On the other hand, if you're if you're working on um, on changing the Docker API, for example, you might want to test. You, you could just use our tests with a fixed version of Cockpit and run a new build of a Fedora image and see if the Cockpit stuff breaks. 
you wouldn't have to write new tests for that. You could just reuse them. You don't have to care how they run. Just, just run them and see if they break. And then at least you're aware of, of something breaking. So what, what our goal is is to, to make testing work more, more like the way open source already does. It's not, not a different thing, right? You, you, want, you, want, you, want to have the open, you want to apply the open source principles to testing. So to use the famous Lego blocks example, it doesn't have to be an unordered pile. If, if you know which parts to pick out, you can save yourselves a lot of work. Um, there's no, no need to always start from scratch. So that's what I mean with the open source principle. You, you reuse things that, are re that, that, are, that make sense to reuse and only write new things when you have to. Um, so, like I said, testables from, from, testables from upstream can be invariants downstream. It really, the, the, the terminology upstream and downstream becomes a bit muddy if you think about the feedback loops. What is upstream, downstream, sidestream, mainstream? I don't know. Uh, it's just... Yeah, you can, the key is to reuse work. So the same way you would reuse a library, you just reuse a test. And to reiterate what I said earlier, the real magic of continuous integration really happens before you merge. Right? So that's, that's when, you want, when you want to catch the bugs, before something gets merged. Then it's still easy to fix, it's still scoped, and then you can deal with them. The other aspect this continuous delivery. If you, if you automated all the tests and they're packaging anyway, then it's not, not that big of a leap to say, to, to adhere to the, the, the principle of releasing early and often. And that also makes it easier to listen to your customers. Um, it's, it's, still, it's, one of the open, it's one of the core ideas in open source and one of the key factors in the success of Linux. So it's good to keep that in mind. If a user contributes something and you say, okay, this is merged, um, you can, this, this will be pushed to Fedora next week, then it's a lot, a lot more fun for them than to say, please check out our next release in, in six months and you'll see the results of what you did. So that actually helps to drive things forward. And the Agile Manifesto, if, if you look at it, the first, the first three principles in that manifesto, they're actually about delivering rapidly. And that there's a good reason for that. So it's those feedback loops and making sure that, that you stay close to what, you, what you're trying to do and, and think about what you did. So you want to reduce those cycles and do whatever, whatever it takes to make that happen. In Cockpit's case, we release weekly. So every n months is not nearly enough to do that. So delivering, of course, depends on the, on the, the project that you're working on. Um, it could be a testable, runnable package. Um, it could be a complete release. It's, it's what you decide it to be, right? Um, and to make sure that a community grows, an open source community, um, you need a feedback loop that's, that's really short. So our conclusion is open source is distributed. I think it's difficult to argue against that. Distributed scales, we've noticed that with, with containers and everything. And open source development is distributed. People all over the world contributing to, to projects, making them work. Open source communication is also distributed. Different means of communication, different, different modes, different languages, different places. And similarly, integration testing should also be distributed, since that's part of the development, part of the project. And action and delivery should also be distributed. So to sum it up, we have the code that's upstream. Discussion happens upstream, where it's visible and transparent. Reviews are upstream. Integration testing is upstream. upstream. Packaging is upstream. Delivery is upstream. Open source is upstream. You might see a pattern here. Um, I'd be lying if I said this was easy. And um, of course, no, nothing always works completely that way, but it's, it's a goal to work towards. And um, it needs constant care and attention. And but with everything in open source, it's, you don't have to do it on your own. You don't, you don't hoard what, if, if you don't hoard what you did, but share it, 
then um, you can you can share and maintain it together. And it's not not as much of a burden. Yeah, so I'm at the end of my presentation and we'll go open to, to questions. So there was one question earlier about the, the actual testing uh, yeah, scripts. Yes. Um, I think I'll show you on GitHub if it's accessible. Apparently it's not right now. Yeah, so no internet connection, but I can show you source code. Mm. Is this big enough to read? So what we have is something that's not maximized here. Yeah. So in our testing framework, we have different test suites. We have our, our core testing suite. It's called Verify. Um, we, can, we have these Python tests that um, work with, with PhantomJS. So what we do is we boot up test machines, uh, we, we simulate a browser and it interacts with the JavaScript and clicks on things and checks to see, com basically, basically compares var the variables. So you fill out, fill out text fields, see if the variable is correct, wait for text, that kind of thing. Um, we have known issues with known failures. For example, on Fedora 24, there's uh, a known issue that's found on GitHub um, for mounting fails due to an SLM failure, for example. Mm -hmm. So we, we track those. We have, um, let's see, one more, more complex thing. We have a free IPA test. That um, runs, that pulls up an IP, IP, free IPA instance, and makes it. Let's that's the machine join the domain and test that. So it brings up multiple virtual machines as infrastructure. We have OpenShift tests that bring up OpenShift instances, and we have Avocado tests that use Avocado framework or um, Selenium browser tests. For example, so we see that we test that a login works with Firefox and Chrome with different versions, um, those kind of things. And we have unit tests that compile binaries or just run shell scripts. Does this answer your question? Or uh, yeah, yeah. so in in the in the background we have a set of common scripts. Um, so the, the core of what, what this does is we have scripts that run a virtual machine. Um, it uses libvirt and makes sure that the, the machine is up. That uh, we have in the background, we, we make sure that the, the, the testing network is, is up and running. Um, we have tools to, to download virtual machines. So in, um, right now we have um, the check sums for images in the GitHub repo. So each, each checkout has a specific image it tests against. So if you create a new image, then you change that checksum. And you make sure that everyone can share it. Yeah, and, and tasks, specific, specific scripts that inter, inter, interface with GitHub. But the tests are pretty, pretty separate right now. And um, we're just, I think we're on the verge of, of splitting those out from Cockpit. So if, if there is a project that says, um, that, that says they, can, they can use our testing framework, then we'd be happy to, to, to help make that, make, make that happen. So um, recently I, I did a, a, some work to make our tests work on Jenkins. Right? So, so Jenkins provisions a machine and that runs the tests. I can also, and if, if I run the test locally, let's see what I have this. 
So if I'm here, for example, I can say, um, I want to run a check accounts test for Fedora 24 that will spawn the machine in the background, run the test, and then give me the result. So if, if I'm developing, I can just do a single test. If I want to do them all, I would usually push to GitHub so our infrastructure can do the testing. Should be done in a little bit. So what, what it does is in, in, it, it's, it's really, really spawns the machine, starts <coughs> cockpit, interfaces with that, really clicks on login and all that. Yeah, are there any other questions or comments? That's passed, always good. Okay, then I thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact us on IRC or visit our website. And if you have something that you think should be in cockpit, then don't hesitate to talk to us. Um, you can try it. We, can, we have some example modules, example plugins that you can work with. And it's, it's the, the hurdle is really not that high to, to, get some, to get something running. And we have a lot of the scripts in place to work with the system. So you can basically just start out with, uh, with whatever you want. So the, the individual modules, they don't, they don't have to be in the same JavaScript framework. They don't even have to say have the same build system. So the, all they have to be is uh, installed to, this, to the same target directory on the system. Um, in this case, for example, you have the different, these are the different models that are installed. One, one part that deals with Docker, one uh, that's the basic shell, the system. Um, so if, if, depending on your system, you, you might have different modules here. You, you can write, write a custom one even. And that will then be present when you when you log in. Uh, yeah, I see the the Linux module. Uh, do you look for NDCs or the, also the others like user NDCs, SA servers, and so on? We interface with SE Troubleshoot D. Okay, so everything that SE Troubleshoot can uh, report. Yes. Then can and you can also, if if the version is new enough, then you can also fix issues. So I think, let's see. Apparently I have no alerts right now. <laughs> but for example, you can also set the, you can set the enforce policy to off. Um, a very controversial feature, but <laughs> sometimes it's very helpful. And if, if you had an error, then here you, could, you would be able to, to see the, the details, you could see the, the logs, and you could, if, if there are potential fixes, you can apply them. Yeah, and you have terminal to log in. This is the real session to the system. So you can, uh, you can create yeah, I think we we can do that afterwards if you want. Okay. I think I don't know offhand how to cause one, so I will only cause them when I'm not intending to cause one. Yeah, that's that's a fairly recent feature. Um, the SC troubleshoot team did a lot to to work with us on that to make that happen. That also works via Dbus and, and some, yeah, mostly via Dbus API. And um, yeah, like, like I said, the modules, they don't have to be, um, I know JavaScript is a fast moving uh, thing. So we have, we have parts that are written in, in Angular, we have parts that are written in React, some that use jQuery. And it only affects, each module can choose for themselves what, what they use, if they use ES6 or not. Um, if they use if they use Webpack or just Make, it doesn't really matter. As long as it, as long as it, it interfaces with the, the stable cockpit API, everything works. Yeah. So, thank you again.